Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to today's reddit quickie video taken from the HFY subreddit called Any tool is a hammer written by LG father anthracite the link to the original will be down below and as always I hope that you enjoy The ingenuity of the humans is simply amazing they can take the most random collection of useless crap and make something useful out of it I once saw a human replace an oxygen scrubber using an old compad battery and some plastic bags and duct tape and a vacuum seal hose. I have a friend who works in interstellar shipping and he told me a story of a human patching up a broken warp regulator using nothing but a spatula from the mess hall and a couple screws just long enough to get to the ship to port. Humans are so familiar with this practice that there are several names for it. Jerry-rigging, MacGyvering, and Bodging are all terms used to describe the practice. There are more, I'm sure. There is a story about human troops who were faced with a ravine that they couldn't cross. They had no tools beyond knives and guns, and some assorted hand tools any soldier might carry. What they did have was explosives and rope. They used the explosives to blow away through the trunks of trees, then used ropes tied to the treetop and wrapped around the other tree limbs to lower the trees across the ravine. The product duct tape is alarmingly present in great many of their stories. So prevalent, in fact, that I admit having brought several rolls of the stuff myself. I must admit, while it is hardly ever the best tool for the job, it is the best tool for the job right now. Humans in particular enjoy pushing the limits of utility with this product, using it to make everything from strange containers to clothing. Sometimes I wonder why they do such things. There are only two answers that I have ever received, in some form or another, because I can, and, even more disturbingly, because I wanted to see if I could. To see the height of such human shenanigans, one merely has to search human data nets with the term Rube Goldberg device. Countless videos exist, humans having built complex multi-stage devices that span ridiculous spaces and take a comparatively huge amount of time to accomplish a simple task. Which is often can be done in moments and barehandedly. Why? Why? Because I wanted to. If you ever spend any time around human combat troops in the field, you'll learn the military has its own phrases for such things. Field, expedient repair, or non-standard use are a couple. It should be noted that humans can also use these seemingly innate skill to devise traps and weapons. Pitfalls and snares are amongst the earliest forms of hunting with tools. Humans armed with just rocks and sharpened sticks are not to be trifled with. Their military history is filled with stories of horrific devices built of ingenuity, necessity, and presumably malice. A particularly gruesome example is a can bomb. A small detonator is placed inside a vessel, like a food can or a glass jar. The vessel is then filled with screws, nails, or broken glass. And if the human in question is particularly bloodthirsty, a flammable liquid such as petrol or kerosene. When such a device is activated, despite the small initial explosion, the damage to the enemy troops is significant. The first time I saw this particular racial ability in action, I saw a human trying to disassemble a crate. He didn't have any tools instead of going to retrieve any, literally any tool from the workshop nearby. I saw him look around, grab a piece of stone off the ground and proceed to dismantle the crate by bashing it apart. He then threw the stone over his shoulder and started to clear the wreckage. When I asked him why he did this, he looked at me for a moment and said, When you need to pound nails, any tool you find is a hammer. End of story one. Story number two. Cold as hell, also written by LG Father Anthracite. The link will be below. The gathered siphons were confused. They had been called here for the preservation of research. Upon arrival, they had all been given safety equipment appropriate for their species' physiology and ushered into what was clearly a laboratory. Several of the scientists knew each other, some only by reputation, but some professionally. 
Amongst the gathered were physicists, metrologists, and a couple high-level mathematicians, and several dozen niche scientists in fields from optics to lasers to quantum mechanics. After a few minutes of idle chit-chat by the attendants, the door opened and a human came in, wearing a lamp coat with a pair of eye goggles pushed all the way up to his forehead. Large, oversized gloves stuck to his lab coat pocket. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out here this evening. I know that you were expecting a presentation on isolating quantum movements in atomic particles, but I decided to have a practical demonstration. If you observe the monitor on the wall, you should be able to see the output of Rama Microscope. On the screen were what appeared to be fuzzy images of ping-pong balls on a white table. What you are seeing there is a string of standard elemental carbon molecules on a standard bed media of doped copper. The device in the corner of the room that looks like a plumbing store exploded through the machine shop laser is a CUDA. However, unlike most laser CUDAs you have seen or heard of, this one has no theoretical lower temperature limit. It takes advantage of a negative energy potential of warp space to allow for the disposition of thermal energy beyond what normal laser CUDAs can achieve. Essentially, it wraps any particle motion out of the known universe without removing the particle in question. So only it can achieve a temperature below absolute zero, but by observing the warp ripples with a standard warp drive calibration unit, we can determine the direction, speed and force of the motion on a subatomic scale, allowing for the quantum motion isolated to be achieved. There was a brief pause as the sofans and attendees as absorbed in the statement that had just been presented to them. After a few beats, the room exploded in a cacophony of questions, laughter and derisive comments. Among the most interesting was the responses were, how do you get the temperature below absolute zero? It's going to reverse the particle motion. I didn't realize that it was time for the Gerberlian festival of levity already. And perhaps most humorously, leave it to a human to take a perfectly good warp generator and hook lasers up to it. All through several versions of laughter from at least five different stellar systems. The man in front waved in silence. After several minutes, he finally got everyone's attention. He grabbed a stack of paperwork from the nearby lab bench and started handing them out. This is a copy of my math, my blueprints of the device, etc., etc. Feel free to verify my work whenever you want. But before you bust out your calculators, let me run my demonstration. Several of the people were inclined to leave, and one or two voiced concerns as the man in the lamp coat went around starting up his apparatus. Some leafed through the materials presented, others watched in bizarre fascination. One particularly worried spectator asked, If it can make something infinitely cold, how do you know it won't cause a chain reaction and freeze the whole area? Well, for one, the chamber is isolated and has a near-perfect vacuum pulled on it. There shouldn't be anything in there to chain react with the carbon. And do. Well... Let's say that I'm pretty sure that it's not going to cause any problems. The biggest danger this whole thing is that one of the capacitors on the laser's power banks blows, and we get a light show. The man finished ripping switches and dialing knobs, and lowered his goggles into place. Safety first, people. Rub up. It's time for science. He pulled out the oversized gloves and pulled them as everyone else put on goggles that they had been handed and moved behind the orange tinted blast shield. Once everyone was ready, the man turned and hit the large red button. There was a brief moment when nothing happened, and then several things started happening all at once. The device in the corner started making a strange thrumming noise. The condensation started to pour off its surface. On the screen, the fuzzy ping-pong slowly began to get less and less fuzzy, revealing the small individual dots orbiting of a group of slightly larger dots. After a few minutes, the small dots had nearly ceased moving entirely. Minus 273.1 degrees Celsius and dropping. Engaging warp space motion isolator, the man was monitoring a smaller screen with various readouts and data streams on it. He typed a few keystrokes into the keyboard and a second thrumming noise. In counterpoint to the first started, on the main display, a temperature readout at the corner dropped minus 273.14. Suddenly, 
The noise cut out the screen went dark, and everyone looked around confused. The man in a black suit and shirt with a red tie suddenly spoke from the corner. Jerry, is that you? The man running the experiment turned around, his jaw hanging open. Jerry, please stop doing this. I have a lot of things to do, and I can't keep coming here to stop you. He looked over at the apparatus, and after a second reached out an arm through the solid metal side and removed the small lens from the device. The machine steel wall seemed to not impede his movements at all. I have to give you credit, Jerry. No one has found four ways to end the universe in a single lifetime before. He held up the lens and looked through it for a moment, and then placed it inside his pocket. You're a smart kid. Stop poking around with physics and do something useful, like medicine or watercolors. He turned and saw the others in the room watching silently from behind the blast shield. Oh, that won't do. He waved a hand, and all the research papers that they were holding vanished. Don't want this leaking out. Wouldn't want to make a second trip. Well, I need to go. Please, don't go make me come back here again, Jerry. The man in the suit turned away from the frozen group of sofons. He disappeared as he spun. Jerry pulled off his goggles and sat dejectedly on the edge of his stool. Man, I thought I had the math right in this one. After a few beats, the Bloxerian mathematician asked, Did anyone else see a bavorg of darkness just now? I'm pretty sure that that was the devil, said the human laser specialist. No, that was the girl, the creeping nothing, said Bucknar, the warp generator designer. Jerry got up from his stool and said, Sorry to waste everyone's time. Please go home. The experiment is a failure. After about three seconds, the room erupted into screaming demands for an explanation. Several religion chants and prayers, and one sofant asking for directions to the restroom. Jerry calmed everyone down, gave directions to a bathroom, and started a pot of tea. Once everyone had calmed down a little, he began to explain. It appears as though I have a knack for designing experiments that might, well, sort of, um, accelerate entropy. When I do them, that guy shows up and dismantles my equipment and destroys my research. This is the fourth time he showed up. He told me that he was one of the people who came before. Before what? asked the back and all. The universe. But he said that he isn't a god or anything. He said that his job is to clean up where the universe is done. Excuse me, I need to find an art class. End of story. And that, my friends, is the end of this Reddit quickie. I hope that you enjoyed. If you'd like to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, listed in the description down below. The easiest and best way would be to share this video and my channel as much as possible. I'll see you all in the next video, and I hope that you have a good one until then. Cheers.